On the afternoon of Friday, November 21st, 1902, Captain James McMaw of the Lake Freighter Algonquin peered through his binoculars into the haze that hung over Lake Superior. Despite the low visibility and mild gusts, the weather was nothing too challenging for the upbound Algonquin. Around 80 miles off Keweenaw Point, Captain McMaw sighted the silhouette of another freighter making her way downbound about seven miles away. He immediately recognized the steamer's three-masted profile. It was a vessel the experienced captain knew well, a 245-foot wheat carrier that frequently shared the same route as the Algonquin, called the Bannockburn. This late into the season, there were not many vessels left on the lake. Captain McMahon noted that the Bannockburn wasn't towing her two barges, probably due to the likelihood of rough late November weather on these final runs. He recorded the sighting in his ship's log and noted that she seemed to be making good weather, with nothing unusual to report. A minute or so later, Captain McMaw raised his binoculars to take another look, but the Bannockburn was gone. Baffled by the sudden disappearance, he scanned the horizon over and over. It would have been impossible for any vessel to sail out of view in just the brief moment in which he looked away. But the Algonquin was alone in the vastness of Lake Superior. There would never be another confirmed sighting of the Bannockburn ever again. Only the day before, the Canadian registered freighter Bannockburn was loading grain at the Canadian Northern Elevator at Port Arthur. She was preparing to carry 85,000 bushels of wheat to Midland, Ontario in Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. The SS Bannockburn was a British-built ship constructed at the Sir Railton Dixon and Company shipyard in Middlesbrough on the Tees Estuary in 1893. She came in at 1,620 tons, with a length of 245 feet or 74.4 meters and a 40 foot or 12.2 meter beam. She was powered by a triple expansion three-cylinder engine fired by two boilers. Not long after her launch, she arrived in Canada to join the Montreal Transportation Company fleet based in Ontario. The grain trade at the time involved frequent transiting of the Welland Canal and the small locks at the St. Lawrence River, which limited the size of vessels in the fleet. The Bannockburn was about the maximum size of a vessel capable of operating this route. On this voyage, she was commanded by 37-year-old Captain George R. Wood from Port Dalhousie, Ontario. While this was his first season on the Bannockburn, he spent the previous year commanding another company vessel, the Glengarry, and was considered an experienced navigator by this time. In a strange coincidence, his brother Eugene Wood was chief engineer on the ill-fated car ferry Marquette and Bessemer No. 2, which was lost in a storm on Lake Erie on December 8, 1909. The rest of the crew was very young. Of the 20 other men, 33-year-old chief engineer George Booth was the only married man on board. The next oldest crew members were 24-year-old first assistant engineer Charles Selby and the 22-year-old second mate William Chalky. Selby had just been elevated for this voyage after the previous first engineer abruptly left the ship only a few days before. A new second assistant, Joseph Dawson, was brought in at the last minute. The rest of the crew ranged in ages from 17 to 20. The youngest crew member was the wheelsman Callahan. He was an orphan working on board to support his three younger brothers. He was just 16 years old. At the time, it was extremely common for Great Lakes shipping companies to employ young and inexperienced crews so that they could keep wages as low as possible and maximize profits. It was an extremely lucrative business. As the Bannockburn finished loading, Captain Wood remarked to the elevator superintendent, Mr. Sellers, that he expected good weather on this run, and he thought they might even be able to get another one in before the end of the season. Mr. Sellers, a man with many more years of experience, doubted this very much, observing that ice was already beginning to build out from the shore. He knew that the season was already coming to an end. The Bannockburn departed Port Arthur on November 21st, 1902, at around 9 in the morning. She was actually scheduled to leave a day earlier, but as she made her way to the open lake, she briefly ran aground and was forced to turn back. After a thorough examination, it was found that the damage was minimal, and she was declared perfectly sound and cleared to begin the voyage. 
After her departure, almost nothing is known about what happened on the final voyage. Her average speed and departure time would put her right around where she was sighted by Captain McMaw of the Algonquin. But aside from suddenly vanishing from view, the captain didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. Nothing that would hint to any trouble on board. As the Algonquin made her way upbound that evening, she soon encountered a stiff breeze and heavier seas, but she arrived safely in port without much trouble. As night fell, a storm descended over Lake Superior with towering seas and punishing winds. Captain McMaw felt lucky that he had made it to port before the worst of the November gale blew in. He pitied any vessel that might still be out on the lake. That night, the Northern Navigation Company's passenger steamer Heronic, a sister ship of the ill-fated Neuronic which would burn in Toronto Harbor in September of 1949, was sailing upbound to Port Arthur when heavy snow began to fall. A young waiter on board, Fred Landon, kept a daily diary of his experience. He noted that on the 21st, the ship encountered the worst storm of the season. The weather was so intense that the ship's engines were damaged and had to be repaired the next day. While he was serving breakfast the next morning, Landon overheard one of the officers remark that they had sighted the lights of the Bannockburn fighting through the storm during the night, but no one on board thought much more about the sighting. The Heronic arrived in Port Arthur and departed for another downbound voyage on the 25th. It wasn't until they arrived in Sarnia on the 28th that they learned that the ship that they had seen in the night had gone missing. Meanwhile, as the Bannockburn became seriously overdue at the Sioux Locks, a period of wild speculation and uncertainty soon set in. It wasn't uncommon for ships to get delayed, especially in rough weather, and at first, the Montreal Transportation Company wasn't concerned about the missing vessel. But as time went on and the families of her missing crew became more desperate, pressure mounted on the company to explain what happened to the missing sailors. In the days after the Bannockburn's scheduled arrival, no one seemed to know whether the ship was actually missing or just stranded somewhere. Engine failures happened somewhat regularly, especially during storms, and every couple of seasons a ship would go well past her scheduled arrival, only to be discovered sitting idle or grounded only a few days later. This was before ships were equipped with wireless sets. Communication was limited to as far as the eye could see. Once a ship passed out of visual range, she was lost until she was spotted somewhere else. On November 26th, a manager of the Montreal Transportation Company, Mr. L. L. Henderson, under mounting pressure from the families of the crew, claimed that he had received word from the office of the ship's underwriter that the Bannockburn was located on the north shore of Lake Superior, opposite Michipicoden Island, and her crew was safe. He said that the report came from a ship called the Germanic. A large salvage tug called the Favorite was sent to the scene to investigate, but after steaming for miles up and down the bleak shoreline, no trace of the missing ship was ever found. The officers of the Georgic were questioned about the report, but they were adamant that no one on board made any such claim. They went on to say that if any stranded ship was sighted, they would have investigated immediately to assist anyone who might need saving. It's very unclear where Henderson got his information, and when he was pressed for answers, he only became vaguer. If Captain Wood found himself lost in the storm, it's likely that he would have searched for the light at Caribou Island. He might not have known that the light was intentionally shut off for the season on November 15th. This early shutoff date would cause a great deal of controversy since many ships passed through the area sometimes as late as the early weeks of December. Another tug called the Boynton was sent to search the shoals around Caribou Island and retrace the shoreline searched by the favorite. Again, nothing was found. And even before the Boynton returned, the Bonnockburn was officially declared lost on November 30th, 1902. Almost no trace of the Bannockburn or her crew were ever found. On November 25th, before the ship was declared missing, a steamer called the John D. Rockefeller sailed through a debris field near Standard Brock Light but it was unclear to the crew of the steamer where the debris came from. The only confirmed trace of the Bannockburn was discovered on Friday, December 12th at the Grand Marais Life Saving Station, when a cork life preserver 
and a single oar from the ship were found on the beach. The total lack of information left few answers to the fate of the Bannockburn and the 21 men on board. Captain McMaw of the Algonquin theorized that she was taken down by a sudden boiler explosion. That was the only way that he could explain her suddenly vanishing from sight that afternoon. But there's no evidence to back this theory, and McMaw himself admitted that he neither saw nor heard any signs of an explosion. Boiler explosions, though commonly speculated about at the time, were exceedingly rare, especially in newer, well-maintained vessels like the Bannockburn. At the end of the season, when the lock of the Canadian Sioux was drained, a single steel hull plate was discovered. No one was able to definitively link the plate to the Bannockburn, but it led credence to a theory that she sailed into the gale with a weakened hull that failed in the heavy seas. But there's little other evidence to support this theory either, especially given that her hull was inspected just before leaving. The most credible final sighting of the Bannockburn came from the Algonquin, occurring almost exactly where the ship would have been expected to be at the time, given her planned course. The sighting was also properly recorded before the ship went missing. While the men in the pilot house of the Heronic were adamant that they saw the lights of the Bannockburn that night in the darkness of the raging storm, it's not clear that the light they saw was indeed the missing ship. The Heronic might well have been the last vessel to see the Bannockburn before she met her final fate. But as the years went on, they would prove to be far from the last sailors on Lake Superior, to believe that they spotted the Bannockburn fighting through a dark storm in the waters around Caribou Island. Throughout the early half of the 20th century, the Bannockburn mystery sparked the imagination of superstitious sailors on the lakes. For years after the disappearance, on dark and stormy nights, sailors would frequently claim to see the lights of a phantom ship fighting her way down Lake Superior, searching for the light at Caribou Island. These strange sightings were almost always attributed to the Bannockburn, and she quickly earned the nickname, the Flying Dutchman of Lake Superior. But as the years passed, and those who sailed the lakes in 1902, aged and eventually passed away, the mystery of the Bannockburn all but faded into memory, replaced by more spectacular and recent disasters. But it's easy to see why her story was so captivating. In those early days, late season losses were common. Tonnage was easy to replace, and there were plenty of young men eager to work. The term ghost ship gets thrown around a lot, and people debate what it actually refers to. Is it a derelict ship left to drift without a crew? Is it a vessel that vanishes in the night without a trace, only to be spotted again and again throughout the years, hiding in the mist? It's an evocative idea that somewhere in the vastness of the seas and the lakes of the world, phantom vessels lurk just beyond the fog. A romantic notion that the young men who were sacrificed in the name of commerce somehow live on. The idea that a young sailor can continue in some ghostly realm lends significance to a life cut short by the pursuit of profits. Letting us believe that the sacrifice of a loved one was somehow worth it. Thank you so much for watching. What do you think happened to the Bannockburn? It's definitely a strange story with not a lot of answers. If you enjoyed this story, help the channel grow by liking, commenting, and hitting that old subscribe button. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. They are truly my phantom light in the storm, but in a good, comforting way. All right, crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.